My name is Chris Vaughn, a resident of the Wakefield area. Our campaign has been organized to protect the Porkies, protect Lake Superior, and stop the Copperwood Mine. ProtectThePorkies.com is the hub of all of our information. It was launched on June 1st of this year. You're invited to visit for more information, subscribe to our email list to stay in touch. And at the end of this presentation, please reach out for any reason at protecttheporkies at gmail.com. Presentation outline, 20 to 30 minutes. I'm gonna line out all of the arguments for and against the Copperwood Mine, give the current status of Highland Copper and the Copperwood Mine, as well as the state of the campaign, and give you some actions you can take to contribute. So I want everyone to feel like they've left this meeting with uh, several ways that they can personally help in our campaign. For the remainder of the meeting, open the floor to comments and questions. Could be uh, for 10 minutes or an hour, as long as people feel is necessary. So here is an overview. This is our, our mission here. The proposed Copperwood mine owned by Canadian company Highland Copper would be situated at the juncture of Lake Superior and Porcupine Mountain State Park. Thus, the mine's operation threatens both a thriving outdoor recreation area and an ecosystem unique in the world. Regardless of how one feels about mining, most sane folk can agree that this location is far from ideal. Especially given copper's status as a non-critical mineral, copperwood's ecological and economic risks are not found to be justified. Despite lacking 90% of their initial capital, Highland Copper is already clear-cutting forest, rerouting streams, and destroying wetlands. There is no reason to delay further. The project should be scrapped immediately. Here is a map of the area. We see Lake Superior and Porcupine Mountain State Park. Highland Copper is advancing the Copperwood Mine on the west entrance of the park near the Presque Isle Scenic Area. They are also, uh, they were formerly the owners of the White Pine Mine. They've since sold 66% of the shares to another Canadian company. This is the permitting status of both of their mines. Because the Copperwood Mine is fully permitted for pre-construction activities, it is our current priority. We are, however, continuing to track uh, the White Pine Mine as it progresses. So Highland Copper is the Canadian company who owns both mines. This is a headline that came out in 2018, a mining company responsible for muddy mess in Porcupine Mountains fined $25,000. So the mining company's big mistake came when it continued to test drilling operations during spring snowmelt in and around wetlands without first obtaining the necessary wetlands or soil erosion and sediment control permits. Certainly doesn't inspire any confidence. So this was uh, the first impression of Highland Copper as they arrived on the scene. This kind of industrial activity is totally incompatible with the pristine wilderness character of the Porcupine Mountains, it is simply the wrong place for mining. Pretty decisive words. Here we see some photos of the region. On the left there is an old growth Eastern Hemlock tree. In the center there is Lake Superior. And on the right is the Presque Isle River. Copperwood would be a sulfide mine in the heart of a world-class outdoor recreation area. So I wanna give you an overview um, of mining and the big picture of mining before we zoom in on the specifics of the Copperwood mine. So the footprint of a mine can be difficult to calculate across both time and, sp and space. When we talk about uh, how the mine is gonna affect the area, what I really want to emphasize is that this is not going to stop. Any influence of the mine will not stop at the property borders on the map. So mines can influence outwards, both in terms of time and space. Here we have an example going way back to the Wadi Fainan mine in Jordan, which was an ancient Roman mine over 1,500 years ago. That area in Jordan continues to be highly contaminated. 
So the 2000 year old pollution is just as harmful in the 21st century in this area of Jordan. The growth of plants is stunted, reproductive systems severely damaged. Uh, the area's goats are prized because their stomachs are parasite free, but this is because their guts are poisonous through being contaminated with mineral pollutants. So I'm not saying that mining technology hasn't changed. However, the footprint continues to be difficult to calculate. Also in terms of space, here's another example. Ancient, roaming, ancient Roman mining activity led to fugitive dust, lead emissions from sources such as the mining and smelting of lead silver ores in Europe, drifted with the winds over the ocean, a distance of more than 2,800 miles. So now they can actually take ice samples in Greenland and judging by the amount of lead content, they can track the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. So when we're talking about mining, we're talking about influences that will extend well beyond the 13 year life of Copperwood and also well beyond the project's boundaries. Mining technology may have improved since then, but not as much as you might think. This is a quote from Dave Bluen of the Wisconsin Sierra Club. Modern mining technology is not protecting the environment. An independent study in 2012 reviewed the environmental track record of 14 out of 16 operating copper sulfide mines responsible for 89% of US copper production. The study found that 92% failed to control mine waste seepage and 100% experienced spills throughout 2012. These are some of the largest mining companies in the world working under American regulations designed to protect us, and yet they all failed. It kind of sounds like this is just the nature of sulfide mining. It isn't the exception, it's the rule that they contaminate the environment. So this is what sulfide mining looks like. Historically, the Upper Peninsula was home to the purest copper deposits in the world. What's called native copper often had an ore grade of 99.9%. It fueled an ancient copper trade throughout North America and was the basis of the copper rush in the 19th and 20th century. That 99% pure native copper is gone. What remains is of an increasingly minuscule ore grade Copperwood's ore grade is 1 to 1.5%, so nearly 99% of what comes out of the ground will not be copper, but sulfide bearing waste to be stored on site forever. That's why we call copper a sulfide mine rather than a copper mine. Um, you know, if you, if 99% of what you make are shoes and 1% of what you make are hats, you would best be classified as a shoemaker, not a hat maker. In this case, 99% of what's coming out is waste, sulfide bearing waste. So copperwood is best described as a sulfide mine. This is the location of where that waste will be stored in proximity to Lake Superior. This would be the closest sulfide waste superior to Lake Superior in history. Closest sulfide waste facility to Lake Superior in history. A bit about Lake Superior. By surface area, it's the largest freshwater lake on Earth. It contains 10% of the world's surface fresh water. It's the wildest and cleanest of all Great Lakes. It's also the headwaters of all Great Lakes, meaning that everything that happens to Lake Superior eventually will lead to the others. However, there will be no rush. It takes 191 years for a drop of water to cycle on into Lake Huron. On to Porcupine Mountain State Park. This is the largest state park in Michigan, one of the only state parks in the country to contain a designated wilderness area. It's the largest mixed old growth forest in the Midwest. About 30,000 plus acres are old growth out of 65,000 acres in total. It also contains the largest population of old growth Eastern hemlock trees remaining in the country. You may or may not be aware, but eastern hemlocks uh, out east, where they are used to be found in large numbers, have all but been decimated by a parasite called the woolly adelgid. So the fact that we have so many old growth eastern hemlocks here is an amazing resource and an honor. Porcupine Mountain State Park is not just any park. It was ranked last year as the most beautiful state park in the entire country. 
This was uh, an analysis of Yelp and TripAdvisor reviews. There's probably many most beautiful state parks in the country, uh, and these rankings change every year. Regardless, the Porkies is a spectacular place, and anyone who hasn't visited, visited, I encourage you to visit as soon as you can. The mine would also be in extreme proximity to the North Country Trail, the longest of all point-to-point -point national hiking trails. The North Country Trail stretches 4,800 miles from North Dakota to Vermont and is a cornerstone of this region's natural heritage. Here is the location of the mining infrastructure. That bright green line is the North Country Trail. It's less than a quarter mile from the tailings disposal facility. This summer, you could see, while you were walking down the trail, you could see clear cutting, heavy machinery, stream alteration while standing on the trail. This is Manabezo Falls on the Presque Isle River in the Presque Isle scenic area. The Presque Isle River is not just beautiful, it is steeped in history. Long before the arrival of Europeans, the Anishinaabe, also known as the Ojibwe, had a seasonal village near its mouth. Later, the Anishinaabe met to trade with French trappers on the very beach where tourists gather today. So these are some of the trail signs that you will find while hiking along the Presque Isle River. Manabizo, Manito, Nawadaha are the three waterfalls here. These are all Anishinaabe words. Um, even the name Porcupine Mountains comes from the Anishinaabe word cog, meaning porcupine and porcupine mountains, cog waju. I'm sure that pronunciation is terrible, but the point here being is that this is an area with a lot of history that we should be very proud of and try to respect. Here is where Copperwood would be located in relation to the indigenous bands in the area. Under the text of the 1842 treaty, the Anishinaabe maintain the right to hunt, fish, and forage in ceded territory as they have since time immemorial. Copperwood represents a real and significant threat to multiple treaty resources, including fisheries, water, and wildlife. If Copperwood is developed, outdoor recreationists may be subjected to air pollution, water pollution, sound pollution, light pollution, subterranean blasts, nonstop industrial traffic and ongoing development beyond the mine. We're going to look at many of these individually. Um, subterranean blasts spread for miles in all directions and is just another example of how the footprint of a mine doesn't stop at the border. The same can be said of light pollution, sound pollution, water pollution, air pollution. There are only a couple entrance roads to the state park uh, they are both very humble county roads. So just imagine you're going to your favorite outdoor recreation area to walk along the river or to sit on the coast of Lake Superior. And to get there, you have to slog through a traffic jam of, of mining traffic. That final point, ongoing development beyond the mine, is something that we don't often pay attention to. But uh, you know, this doesn't stop and start with the mine. Once the mine is developed, it will pave the way for increased development beyond mining throughout the decades to come. This is an important concept, shifting baseline syndrome. I wanna read this whole definition here. This occurs when conditions of the natural environment gradually degrade over time. Yet people falsely perceive less change because they do not know or fail to recall accurately how the natural environment looked in the past. So we see that we're not only talking about a mine here, there's already talk with an interested developer in relation to potential housing to accommodate hundreds of persons expected to be employed during the construction and operation of the mine. They might say that this construction is temporary but then when the mine closes, there will be no incentive to remove the housing and it may lead to other infrastructure. Uh, employees might want a bar to go to after work. 
They might need a gas station. There will be road improvements. All of this will be part of shifting baseline syndrome that we might not be tracking. It might take place over the course of, of decades or generations, but it could lead to the wide scale development of this region. There's also talk of a construction of a 25 mile transmission line in order for the mine to operate because there is currently no power grid in this area. Again, they say the infrastructure would be removed when no longer necessary unless the permittee enters into an agreement with another party in which end use is established that includes beneficial use of the electrical service. In other words, they will remove it unless somebody else is using it, which is very likely that in a 25 mile transition line, other folks besides the mine will take advantage of it. And then you've opened up the way. Once the transmission line is there, more development will inevitably follow. This is what shifting baseline syndrome looks like. So something that is not often talked about in environmental campaigns is light pollution. Nights are becoming 10% lighter each year. A child born today that has 250 stars in the sky will see only 100 by their 18th birthday. Artificial light is disruptive uh, to both humans and wildlife. According to research scientists, for nocturnal animals, the introduction of artificial light probably represents the most drastic change human beings have ever made to their environment. This is the Presque Isle campground. It's on a northwest facing shoreline, providing an incredible view both of the night sky and the northern lights. There is currently no significant source of artificial lighting within a five mile radius. So a mine like Copperwood would be a 24 hour operation. It would be lit up like a casino all night long and it would have a tremendous impact on the view of the night sky. There is currently a uh, clause of questionable taste, which states that dark sky preserves may not be established in the Upper Peninsula. We did contact the DNR about trying to get the Presque Isle area and potentially the Porcupine Mountains State Park listed as a dark sky preserve or, or achieve some sort of dark sky classification. The DNR responded citing this clause uh, that says, although you can have dark sky preserves all throughout Michigan, you cannot have them in the Upper Peninsula. This dates back to 1994. However, international dark sky parks are not prohibited in the Upper Peninsula. This is a different classification from a completely different um, operation, the International Dark Sky Association. An example of an international dark sky park can already be found in Upper Peninsula, the Keweenaw International Dark Sky Park near Copper Harbor. If they can do it, there's no reason that the Porkies or the Presque Isle area couldn't. But understandably, there is some tension because they are a state park. Uh, they do want to abide by any official clause. For more information, you can go to darkskymichigan.org. And the abolition of this clause should be of highest environmental priority because dark sky awareness and protection um, is a way to just achieve overall ecological protection in general. So infrasound is very low frequency sound that cannot be detected by human ears. It occurs in conjunction with geophysical changes that cause massive disasters, such as earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, and other large scale phenomenon. Um, with a operating mine nearby, there will be subterranean blasting, there will be rock grinding, uh, potentially diesel generators, all of this produces a tremendous amount of very low frequency sound, which travels for many miles. As you can see here, infrasound is the language of disaster. It's how elephants and other animals can sense when earthquakes and tsunamis are coming. So even if you don't hear it, uh, biologically, we, are, we, we have evolved to feel it. 
and it induces feelings of stress. So just imagine you are visiting a, a beautiful nature park to specifically escape all of the stress and tension of city life. And you have to hear and feel infrasound um, through subterranean blasts, rock grinding, and diesel generators. Again, it affects us even when we cannot perceive it. So here's another view of that map. The mineral rights under the state park now belong to Highland Copper. There is the potential for them to access, to drill under the Prescal River and extract copper from beneath old growth forest on park property. They currently say they have no intention of doing this. However, intentions change as the higher grade ore disappears and as the price of copper increases. Outdoor recreation contributes 10.8 billion to Michigan's economy. Mining brings in 1 billion. That's more than a 10 times difference. Outdoor recreation is strong and sustained. Mining is boom and bust. Copperwood has a mine life of 13 years. Outdoor recreation promotes protection of the natural world. Mining actively endangers it. So the case can easily be made that the fall, far smaller industry should not endanger the larger by jeopardizing access to pristine nature, which is its foundation. But what about jobs? So the main selling point here is that the mine will create jobs for folks in the region. However, contrary to popular belief, copper mining and mining in general does not always lead. In, in fact, more often than not, it, it leads to negative economic outcomes. Uh, this first study on the left was commissioned in relation to a proposed sulfide mine near the boundary waters and was found that the job losses in the area from reduced outdoor recreation would offset any job gains seen as a result of new mining activity. Here we have another study on the right from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So I'm just gonna read one section here, that highlighted section, contrary to the long established assumptions, but consistent with more recent critiques, roughly half of all published findings indicate negative economic outcomes in mining communities, with remaining findings split roughly between favorable and neutral. In other words, only 25% were favorable economic outcomes. Those positive findings, that 25%, um, were more likely to come from Western United States where much of the mining involves new coal strip mines. And over half of the positive findings comes from years prior to 1982. So we're talking about just a small fraction of mines that actually lead to any sort of economic benefit for the community. What about green energy? Folks might make, make the case that uh, copper wood is somehow contributing to green energy, but from the most comprehensive study undertaken by UN Environment, we see that not only do 20% of health impacts come from air pollution, but the processing of metals and the extraction of minerals is responsible for 26% of global carbon emissions. A new study which came out just last week shows that sensitive ecosystems are at risk for mine waste. Um, specifically, mine tailings contain the waste and residue that remain after mineral processing. The storage facilities built to contain it are some of the world's largest engineered structures. Our findings suggest that mine waste threaten biodiversity within protected areas all over the world. Something like a third, 9% um, of mine tailings facilities were within protected areas and 20% were within five kilometers. So neither of these things fit within any definition of green that most people can fathom. Here is a photo from the site of Copperwood taken during their activities this summer. This used to be a wetland. Now it looks more like a suburban lawn. Highland Copper is permitted to destroy 57 acres of wetland. That's the second largest in Michigan permitting history. In addition to being uh, tremendous carbon sinks, wetlands are teeming with an incredible biodiversity of organisms. 
This is so-called wetland mitigation. This is also from the site of Copperwood. They have uh, destroyed 20 acres here and they're going to make new wetlands. So I destroy your established neighborhood and then I destroy someone else's and I fill it with water, plant some cattails and we call it good. Again, no relation to green energy whatsoever. So from the 2018 feasibility report on the Copperwood mine, if you go to page 375, there is a list of many species of special concern, species that are threatened and species which are endangered. I'm just going to scroll through here quickly. Uh, all of these species have been observed on the mine site or on the shore of Lake Superior where the uh, rerouted streams empty out. The red side dace is recognized as an endangered species in Michigan. It's found in Namibinog Creek, where Highland Copper is permitted to dump up to half a billion gallons of wastewater every day. Copperwood Mine is also right in the middle of where two gray wolf packs um, have their territory. So sulfide mining can contaminate in quite a number of ways. I am not a geologist uh, nor an expert on these matters, um, nor do we have the time to go into all of these in, in depth. However, I will provide resources for folks to do further research. Different ways in which mines can contaminate through changing the acidity of waterways, through the introduction of heavy metals, through sediments and suspended solids, through hydrogen sulfide production, smelting, dewatering. So that point about dewatering, I was not aware that uh, mines often use as much water as entire cities. And specifically, uh, when you create a massive cavity where ore is being extracted, groundwater fills that cavity and needs to be removed and then introduced uh, into the surface area. And oftentimes that groundwater may be carrying heavy metals with it. Fugitive dust, that's what we talked about when uh, that dust traveled from ancient Roman copper mining all the way to Greenland 3,000 miles away. This is also from the mining cavity when you're uh, exploding ore, it's creating tremendous quantities of particulate matter which is then ventilated out of the chamber where it catches on the wind and can't be controlled. This is an overview of acid mine drainage from Dr. Steve Emmerman's presentation on the myth of clean mining. So Copperwood's ore body consists of chalcosite, which is copper sulfide. Sulfide minerals are typically stable when beneath the surface but exposure to oxygen converts sulfide minerals to sulfuric acid. Oxidation of sulfide minerals releases heavy metals that were part of the crystal structure of the waste rock or of the ore. Increased acidity in streams causes the release of heavy metals attached to stream sediments. So you get heavy metals coming both from the waste rock and also from uh, heavy metals that were sleeping in stream sediment. I've heard this described as hot water steeping over coffee. So the uh, sulfuric acid, which is also known as battery acid, then steeps over these heavy metal containing waste rock and sediments. Different mines have different risks of acid rock or acid mine drainage. There are open questions regarding the extent to which copper wood will be at risk for this activity. It is, it is um, chalcosite, which is sulfide bearing ore. This is an interesting comment from the public comments from 2018. 
Uh, it mentions the potential for reactive sulfide minerals in the rock of broken and fractured zones above the mining horizon. This means that upwelling groundwater moving through collapsed mine workings could bring oxi oxidized sulfide minerals to within 100 feet or into Lake Superior. This could generate acid rock drainage, which would flow directly into Lake Superior after mining operations cease. While the MPA cites the buffering capabilities of natural calcium, this will only affect groundwater acid neutralization for short time due to calcium's high solubility, and the calcium will not remove metals from the groundwater. So these are folks far more capable than me of discussing these matters, but open questions definitely do remain regarding the potential for acid drainage. Regardless, uh, heavy metals will be a risk, both in terms of acid mine drainage and also fugitive dust and any seepage from the tailings facility. Heavy metals like arsenic, mercury, lead, and cadmium are all found in sulfide mine tailings. These chemicals are on the World Health Organization's top 10 chemicals of public health concern risk. Um, I encourage folks to look into the health impacts of these chemicals and ask, do you really want them in the environment where we are foraging, hunting, and fishing? Do we really want them in Lake Superior, the largest freshwater lake on the planet? It isn't just that the heavy metals are in the water, it's that they bioaccumulate or biomagnify over time. This starts on the level of phytoplankton, which is then consumed by zooplankton, uh, then consumed by fish. The big fish eat the little ones. Uh, the birds eat the fish, the bear eat the fish. The humans eat all of them. And in every step, the concentration of heavy metals increases. Here is another example of bioaccumulation. This is the northern reishi mushroom, which grows exclusively on eastern hemlocks. Again, the Porcupine Mountain State Park is the largest population and cleanest population of eastern hemlock trees. Tinctures and teas yield a number of compounds which exhibit anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, and immune-boosting effects. In Chinese and Japanese medicine, the reishi is known as the mushroom of immortality. Many folks forage uh, medicinal mushrooms in this area. Unfortunately, like wildlife, mushrooms are bioaccumulators of heavy metals and must never be harvested in proximity to past or present industrial activity. If copperwood develops, will foragers cease collecting this ancient medicine for fear it has become a poison? I'm a big mushroom forager myself, so this is something that resonates with me personally. You might be a fisher, you might be a hunter. Um, I think, you know, increasing the quantities of heavy metals in the environment is not good for anybody. Here's a look at that tailings facility. For every ton of extracted material, at best 30 pounds will be copper and 1,970 pounds will be heavy, met heavy metal laden sulfide waste. These red lines are streams which were just rerouted this summer to pass at a right angle around that waste containment facility. All in all, it would hold over 50 million tons of tailings in the middle of an unpredictable water-rich environment. Here's a look at those rerouted streams. Here's a photo um, taken looks like maybe uh, at the beginning of the autumn. So several streams here have been rerouted with their flows combined together. It may not look like much now, uh, but these seasonal streams have an incredible difference in what they look like in the autumn compared to what they look like in the spring during the snow melt. They swell significantly and the impact on erosion can often be unpredictable. I know folks who have had to move their cabins because uh, the springs, uh, be because the seasonal streams have swelled beyond what they were expecting. Chris. Yes. Uh, the only time I'm going to interrupt, I need people to stop and look at this photo. 
these are five living ecosystems that were just absolutely decimated and turned into this absolutely false situation that you're looking at on the screen. And I apologize for interrupting, but this is the critical aspect that I need people to understand. What you are looking at is the absolute obliteration of 2 billion years of ecological development. Right. And so that's why we're making the case that we don't need an operating sulfide mine to oppose these activities. Um, you know, Highland Copper, they still lack 90% of their funding. They still lack a number of permits. And yet they are already devastating this area. A mine may never be developed, especially if we get our way, but they've forever altered these streams. And it's happening on topography that slopes towards Lake Superior. If you see all those waterways, the reason that they all lead towards the lake is because that topography slopes downward. So if anything happens to the facility there, we know exactly where the waste will end up. And uh, we've talked about the contamination risks of sulfide mining. No conversation would be complete without talking about the risk of a tailings dam rupture. So there's a study that came out which is showing that despite increases in mining technology, uh, this, despite advances, the risk of serious and very serious failures of tailings facilities is actually increasing. Uh, this presentation will be available. It's already available on our website. So I encourage folks to come back and study it more in, in depth. Uh, but this study does cite specifically declining ore grades leading to unwieldy quantities of waste, smaller companies operating on tight financial margins and foreign companies, which are more difficult to apprehend if a failure occurs after mine life has ended. Copperwood checks all three of these boxes. So from the public comment document, there are a number of concerns raised about the fact that the environmental assessment was conducted over a decade ago at a time when the south shore of Lake Superior was experiencing below average precipitation. Since then, Lake Superior region has experienced dramatic fluctuations in rainfall patterns with two 500 year precipitation events and one 1000 year precipitation event. With this increase, there is the reasonable assumption that the groundwater table would not be the same as it was during years of drought. Other things will have changed too. Um, the, the amount of wetlands, biological communities, there, there's quite a massive shift from years of low rainfall to high rainfall. So to use the same data more than 12 years later now, when there has been documented changes to the climate is negligent. Let's take a look at that rainfall data, that uh, teal kind of turquoise line there from uh, 2009 to 2011 shows when their environmental assessment was conducted. So there was four inches lower rainfall than the 30 year average. Since that time, however, we've seen four inches higher than the 30 year average in Gogeba County. That's nearly an eight inch swing. There was mention of storm events. Here's an example of a thousand year storm. Uh, this was the famous Father's Day flood of 2018, which uh, th this storm impacted from Ashland all the way through the Keweenaw Peninsula. Record-breaking rain behind the UP floods is something we can expect more of. At a nearby rain gauge at Houghton County Airport, 5.55 uh, inches of rain in only six hours was recorded. That rainfall was a 1,000 year event. That means rainfall that intense only has a one in 1,000 chance of occurring in a given year. So the chances were, were low and yet it happens. The question then, is the mining infrastructure prepared for a thousand year rainfall event? Multiple folks in the public comments ask this. Um, the first in regards to the tailings facility, the applicant is using 100 year data. The facility will not be engineered to withstand these extreme precipitation events. 
Another asks about the sewage lagoon. Has other wa water treatment and conveyance infrastructure also taken the increased size of storm events into consideration? Here is how Highland Copper responds. The infrastructure has been designed to facilitate a 100 year storm event. This was done based on the 13 year mine life. Infrastructure designed on more extreme criteria would enlarge the footprint and are not found to be justified. So in other words, even though we have seen a 1000 year storm event in the area and other 500 year storm events in the Lake Superior region, uh, these guys, because the mine is only expected to last 13 years, are banking on only a 100 year storm event occurring. This is the definition of a gamble. Do we want to gamble with the health of Lake Superior? There it is again. So I want to show a short video on what it looks like when a tailings dam collapses. Not trying to be a, a alarmist or apocalyptic here, but we do need to be realistic about the risks. This first one is from 2019 in Brazil. Again, despite advances in mining technology, tailings collapses, tailings dam collapses are actually increasing. And so what you're seeing there contains a multitude of heavy metals. In case you think uh, that sort of thing only happens in Brazil, here's Canada, the, the experts in mining. It may be the worst environmental disaster in British Columbia's history. Yesterday morning, 10 million cubic meters of wastewater containing dangerous chemicals poured into local waterways when the earthen dam surrounding a tailings pond collapsed. People here are gathering at a community hall tonight with major questions on their mind. The primary one, how did it happen? When it comes to an environmental disaster at a mine, few top this. 10 million cubic meters of water in a tailing pond suddenly broke free, sending tons of mud, sand and debris into a tiny creek, which became a torrent and flowed into Pinell Lake. At a packed community meeting, the company said it takes full responsibility, but it doesn't know why it happened. The town is hit doubly hard. Not only does the spill threaten tourism, but people depend on the mine for jobs. I was really devastated actually, thinking that's where I work, that's, that's my job, and now I can't even go back to work. This lodge not only caters yeah, yeah. to people who fly in to fish, but also to people who work in the mine. I think it means the end of our business because we bring fly fisher people in to fish these lakes and rivers. And, you know, we're known as a pristine, uh, beautiful lakes and rivers. And I, I don't know all what's happened in there, but um, right now we can't take people fishing. That video is available on our YouTube channel. There, there is one quote that will resonate. The mining company says they don't know why it happened. Um, this was an outdoor recreation area near Mount Polly, a town that was ironically called um, Likely, British Columbia, where something very unlikely happened. Uh, they, it was a place where folks came to fish, to stay in lodges, to enjoy outdoor recreation. So the similarities to our area in question are eerie. And again, just let that quote resonate. The operators of the Mount Polly mine were experts in the field of mining. They were following all of the environmental regulations and yet the unpredictable happened. All right, so we're starting to wrap up here. At the time of writing, Copper holds a value of $3.72 per pound. Copper is infinitely recyclable, yet only 35% is being recovered. In May 2023, copper was denied an upgrade of status to critical mineral by the U.S. Geological Society, the highest authority on the matter. Copper is not scarce. An estimated 88% remains in the ground, and the United States exports 10 times as much as it imports. So here's a cost benefit, benefit analysis that a child can understand, but perhaps not a CEO. On one side, we've got copper, a non-critical mineral. On the other side, we have the health of freshwater seas, 
wild coastline, old growth and secondary forest, threatened and endangered species, indigenous treaty resources, pure night skies, a thriving outdoor recreation area, and the right of all humans to enjoy a moment of peace in nature. Does this really look like a good place for a mine? So we're gonna move on now to talk a bit about Highland Copper and then a bit about our campaign. So Highland Copper, again, the folks who already violated permits and degraded wetlands. Here's a recent timeline of their activities. May 23rd, the USGS denied copper critical mineral status despite significant pressure from the industry. On July 15th, Highland Copper initiated summer site prep, clear cutting forest, rerouting streams, destroying wetlands. On July 24th, they received $30 million from Kintera, another Canadian company, with the assurance of 30 million more for the White Pine Mine on the east side of the park. On August 4th, the Department of Energy added copper to the critical materials list. This is different from critical mineral. The critical mineral list is more prestigious and it looks at the facts as we know them. Is there, um, looking at the supply chain, is copper in short supply? No, it is not. The critical material list is forward looking, meaning they're, they are making projections about what may or may not be necessary in the future. So it's highly speculative. On October 12th, Highland Copper's CEO stepped down to be replaced by Chief Financial Officer Barry O'Shea. Still to come, a possible construction decision may occur in 2024 linked to the going market price of copper. This is from a meeting with the DNR. So it looks like the market price of copper will be an important factor here. Um, they have projected a $391 million is the necessary initial capital to begin construction. They currently have 25 million in the bank. So they still lack 90% of their initial capital, which they hope to receive through industry investors, bank loans, and state and federal grants. Uh, the likelihood of receiving this money depends on two factors. Again, the price of copper and also the project's social license or lack thereof. We're going to look at both of those points very quickly. So the price of copper, um, those forward looking projections say that copper will increase in value specifically due to renewable uh, so-called green energy. And we see this is a slide from Highland Copper themselves. They're focusing on renewable energy, electric vehicles, et cetera. Kintera, their Canadian partner is doing the same thing. It's all about clean energy. But again, this slide that we looked at earlier, if mining is responsible for 26% of global emissions, along with uh, processing of metals, in what way does it play a role in battling climate change? If mining is reducing biodiversity, if, if tailings waste is being stored in and near uh, fragile ecosystems, how is it green? This is uh, the definition of greenwashing and is nothing but marketing. So we do see the headlines though. Uh, the next big bull market could be copper. Copper is poised to play a role in the world's green transition. We could talk about this topic for hours and hours. The only point that we wanna make is that we need to make it clear to our elected officials. The proposed copperwood mine is not clean, green or carbon neutral and should hold no place in a healthy climate agenda moving forward. On to the topic of social license. This is something that uh, mining companies are very concerned with because it determines if they will receive cash flow from investors and from state and federal grants. And it raises the question, who does Lake Superior and who does the Porcupine Mountain State Park belong to? Uh, this year, Highland Copper has received a number of resolutions of support from uh, the town of Bessemer, the town of Ironwood, from, from other areas as well. These resolutions of support are not legally binding. They are simply symbols, but symbols are how they show that they have social license and receive money from investors. 
So each of these city councils, which voted for a resolution of support, contained maybe um, six or seven, I'll be generous and say a dozen individuals. So we're looking at the votes of fewer than 100 people, not to undervalue the importance of city councils. However, um, when we're talking about social license, our petition in opposition to the mine has now over 8,500 signatures. The majority of those do come from Michigan residents, though not necessarily from folks living in direct proximity. But again, when we're talking about resources like Lake Superior and Porcupine Mountain State Park, which contains the largest mixed old growth forest in the Midwest, the case can be made that they are not just of local importance, but uh, national and even international importance. So the state of our campaign, Protect the Porkies launched on June 1st. Our petition has over 8,500 signatures. We've been doing video documentation on the YouTube channel. We're on social media. We've got uh, so far just one interview, which I encourage folks to listen to on WORT radio. However, we have been interviewed by others, including TV6, MLive, uh, but nothing has aired quite yet. Our donations from private donors are about $760, but we did recently receive a grant from Freshwater Futures for 3,300. So we're excited to expand the scope of our operations. Some challenges, the mine site is in a remote location with few humans living nearby. Locals have a default pro-mining stance, although this is largely based in a dated view of mining and has shifted among younger generations. Many folks have reached out to us privately to express their concerns regarding the Copperwood mine, uh, but due to the close knit nature of, of these towns, folks aren't necessarily going to speak out publicly. Navigating the friction between the ecological devastation of copper mining versus high tech green energy revolution. This is really a chance for us to ask uh, what do environmentalists stand for? Is the important thing to pad the pockets of uh, massive high tech companies or do we stand for protecting habitat, uh, protecting fresh water as much as possible? We are a small campaign with limited funding going against a multi-million dollar transnational operation. Um, Protect the Porkies, we are not an organization. Uh, we define ourselves as a campaign or more broadly as a movement. We invite everybody to be a part of our movement. Really, the website was just launched to provide information and then what folks do with that information is up to them. Next steps, our strategy will pursue two directions, undermining social license, through increased circulation of the website and petition, uh, scaling up media exposure, continuing to provide video documentation, and potentially doing some legal work, um, which we will explore at a later date. So when folks are finished with our meeting here, we invite everyone to go to our Take Action page. First of all, please sign the petition and share it. Um, you know, internet petitions might seem like a waste of time. However, we do plan on printing ours out and delivering it to the governor's office next year. We encourage you to contact Governor Whitmer and other Michigan um, elected officials, whether you're a Michigan resident or not, and ask Michigan elected officials to request that Governor Whitmer and Attorney General Nessel file an official state petition for review of the Copperwood project. Finally, we need help with media outreach. So in order for this movement to gain steam, in order to undermine social license, we simply need to spread the word as, as far as possible. Um, another activity that you might be interested in, if you go to our petition and go to the bottom and click more updates, there is a link which will give you all of the email addresses of Highland Copper's current investors. You can write to them. You can tell them that there is no social license for this project. This is common practice in opposing mining campaigns. Another option, um, EGLE, which is Michigan's regulatory body who is responsible for issuing the permits to the Copperwood and White Pine Mines are holding two virtual meetings this month. 
specifically regarding the Healthy Climate Plan. So you can register and attend these, and you can ask, how is expanding mining and metal processing, which is responsible for 26% of CO2 emissions in keeping with a healthy climate? Um, and given that Lake Superior is 10% of the world's surface fresh water, how is permitting the closest sulfide mine in history to it a sane idea? Summary, the development of Copperwood by an inexperienced foreign company in the heart of a thriving outdoor recreation area and an unprecedented proximity to 10% of the world's surface fresh water is troubling. Open questions remain regarding the following. The degree of sensory assault to be experienced by outdoor recreationists, the validity of an environmental assessment conducted over 12 years ago in a period of greatly reduced precipitation, the stability of mine infrastructure, specifically the tailings facility, in an unpredictable water-rich environment at the juncture of rerouted streams on topography sloping towards Lake Superior, and the degree to which the mine will shift the baseline and result in wide-scale development of this region via power grid expansion, road improvements, employee housing, and much more beyond our imagining. With so many doubts, it is in the interests of outdoor recreationists hunters, fishers, foragers, natives and non-natives, Democrats, Republicans, and independents, and all those concerned with the well-being of water and natural life to organize against the chopperwood mine as quickly and as vigorously as possible. You can access this presentation on our website. These are some links for further research. Uh, we invite everyone to subscribe to the email list. And with that, I think we can stop the recording, Johnson, and open the floor to any comments or questions that folks may have.